Hi, and welcome to McLean's In Conversation. Uh, my name is Paul Wells. I'm a senior writer for McLean's, and I'm the guy who does these things. I'm speaking to you from Ottawa. And um, before we get started, as always, I want to thank our sponsors at the Canadian Bankers Association, who for now more than three years have been making it possible to have these conversations and to bring them to you. Uh, our guest tonight is um, uh, a familiar face, uh, and one I haven't been able to speak to for a few years because he's, he's at another gig. Uh, his name is Mark Carney. He's former governor of the Bank of Canada. And, and then uh, in an unprecedented move, he went on to become the governor of the Bank of England. Uh, and now he is an author. His new book is, uh, it's called Value slash Values. Um, the subtitle is Building a Better World for All. Um, and um, it uh, is out today. We're, uh, we're broadcasting this to you on the day that this book is published, and so um, uh, you can race out and get it. Uh, and we're going to talk about the the, uh, the 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 themes in that book. Uh, Mark Carney, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Paul. It's good to see you. I'll come back to Ottawa to see you, and I can only do it virtually, but it's a start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's I when, when when we were speaking offline, I asked you where you were. I assumed you're still in London or something, but you've actually been in town, and we're in more or less the same neighborhood uh, for the last several months. Uh, how are you liking being back in Ottawa? Well, I mean, it's, it's great to be back, but it's um, obviously, uh, it's unusual circumstances. We're, I was fortunate uh, in the, it, you know, in, uh, in our setup, um, we have two of our kids here with us still, um, same house, um, same neighborhood. Uh, so we know some people, but it's people you see on the street uh, given uh, the necessary lockdown. Uh, but it's great, yeah, it's good to be home. Okay. Um, this book uh, explores themes that you um, discussed in the in the recent Reef lectures for the BBC, and that makes uh, for a bit of a weird streak here on In Conversation. You're the second Reef lecturer that, that I've interviewed because Margaret McMillan was on a couple months ago. Um, they seem to have a soft spot for Canadians these days, but you had actually been working on the book for, for, for longer than that. Uh, that's right. Yeah, I, start, I was coming up to the end of my time at the Bank of England about this time last year. And I sort of, as a New Year's resolution, I thought, Paul, that um, what I would do is try to look back, reflect on my time at Bank Canada, Bank of England, um, and uh, see what common lessons uh, I, I could draw from that, uh, partly for myself, uh, but also I thought I could impart um, some perspective uh, to others. And when I looked at it, um, really saw that, uh, you know, it was a, it's been a time of crisis, um, crisis of credit. You know, the financial crisis, I started the Bank of Canada when, as governor when that broke. Um, uh, the COVID crisis at the end um, uh, was just breaking as I was uh, leaving the Bank of England and then throughout the, the building and climate crisis. So wanted to uh, use that as the, uh, as the framework and, and, and provide some perspective. You know, from a process perspective, I made that resolution. I should have talked to you as a, as a published author to have a full appreciation of what, it, what what's entailed in writing a book. Um, and um, pretty much um, uh, worked on it straight through up until uh, uh, the reflectures and actually through to through to Christmas in order to be uh, to, in order to be complete. Um, you absolutely followed the advice I would have passed along, uh, which is advice that I got from uh, my former boss, Ken White, who told me, uh, it's impossible to write a book. You can't do it. You have to write chapters and, and you just have to decide uh, what your argument is in each chapter and, and how they go together to, 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 to form an overall argument. And um, not just the subject matter, but the tone of your book changes fairly, fairly uh, markedly from chapter to chapter. You're, there, there, there's a, near the beginning, it, there's an essentially um, uh, a history of an economic history of, of money that goes back to the Magna Carta uh, it mentions uh, one of the great Bank of uh, England governors of the, of the mid-century, uh, Montague, and, um, um, and and then there's there's stuff that is uh, altogether um, uh, more about the news and about about current events. And there's a chapter about Canada, and I have to wonder: um, this book's being published in the UK and in, and in the United States simultaneously. Is the Canada chapter in those books? <laughs> no, it's not, Paul. Um, there is a similar chapter in those uh, jurisdictions, but it, which is a more general chapter uh, for lessons. So, I mean, the book is in three parts, and the first part is about, in effect, the history of value. So, how do, how do we look at value, um, uh, both in art uh, and, very importantly, in economics, 
um, and what has happened over time in economics, uh, the perspectives on value and how that has moved from something that is intrinsic to the object itself or to the work that goes into creating the object um, to being in the eye of the beholder. In other words, in the price in the market. So if something is not in the market, it doesn't have value. That's, that's how things have moved. Um, and what has been the consequences of those, um, uh, including for the value of money and how money is used to value, but also what it does to things that are outside of the market and how they're valued and, and, and the interaction between the two. I, I think that for me, um, that was a necessary um, setup for the middle chapters, which are around the crises. Um, and then the third part um, is around, well, what are the implications for for leaders, whether you're in the charitable sector or for a company, for investors, uh, for companies themselves, and for countries. And so um, I thought that, um, you know, I would tailor a, a chapter for Canada out of, uh, out of the broader uh, the broader recommendations uh, that, that were in the, uh, the, the general uh, or international country chapter. Okay. The title of the book is a play on words. Uh, it, it, it's about the difference between, or the potential difference between what the market values um, at, uh, yeah. in economics and what we value at a human level. Um, and I know most of the economists, uh, most of the economists I know hate that distinction because they believe, uh, and they argue quite strongly that um, the gap between value and values is, 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 uh, is overstated and that in fact, any decent economist uh, works all the time with things like um, uh, 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 economic uh, cost of environmental degradation and things like that. Um, you suggest that there's still some work to be done to, to narrow that gap between value and, and our values. Well, I think, I think there's two things, a few things about it. One is that there, the relationship, there's a causality, there's a relationship between the two. Um, so if you, the, the increasing role of the market can affect underlying societal values, um, increasing role of bringing um, secular or, or, or bringing items into the market, such as uh, uh, paying for childcare, paying for charity, um, uh, for example, paying for blood donations. There's lots of evidence around this. All these types of things, when you bring um, elements that are outside of the market, uh, you can change their nature. Um, and there, in some cases, there can be a corrosion of their value. Um, then there are a whole host of issues that are outside the market, which we value, but don't put a price on it. You know, the example, uh, one of the examples I give is just the difference between the value of Amazon, the company, one and a half trillion plus. I mean, it's by the time this comes out, maybe it's 1.7 or so uh, trillion. Um, and then the Amazon, the region, and the Amazon, the region has no value, doesn't appear on any financial ledger until it's stripped of its foliage and converted into, uh, in, into pasture. Uh, for, uh, for agriculture. Um, and so there's a number of those, uh, there's a number of those disconnects uh, between the two. But also if I can go back, if you'll forgive me for going back to the sort of political economy, and that's part of the reason for the early chapters is that, you know, and I'm, you know, full blooded economist and, you know, central banker and uh, uh, many respects uh, orthodox, but my orthodoxy also goes back to both sides of Adam Smith. And so, you know, often people stop at the laissez-faire aspect of Adam Smith, um, but ignore the uh, moral sentiments element of Adam Smith. And Smith is very much about the social construct of the market um, and the necessary social construct of the market. And certainly in my experience, it has been, and it was classically the experience in the case of the financial crisis, which um, a, a creeping market fundamentalism financial markets undercut the social construct of those markets and led to the crisis. So this is about rebalancing the causality of the two uh, or, or the relationship between the two, between value and values. And no, I don't think that um, uh, economics purely of itself, economics distilled can capture and price everything that we value as a society. Um, you draw a distinction between a market economy, which is which makes perfect sense, and a market society, which is pushing things too far. And I believe you argue that the, the, the banking crisis in 2007-2008 was a product of um, uh, going a little too far into a market society. Yeah, I, I, it, yes. And 
uh, in several respects. Part of it was, um, and I saw this in the run-up to it, with uh, the advent of securitization and these various structured products, um, a sort of pure market approach to finance would be that whenever there is um, a shortcoming, uh, excess volatility, a, a challenge, the issue is missing markets because ultimately in the and again, I'm sorry to go into jargon, but the fundamental welfare theorem of economics, if you have perfect competition, perfect information, um, and complete markets, then you will come to optimal outcomes for everybody. But you never can have complete markets. And building markets on markets, or you often can't have complete markets, building markets on top of markets, which is what was the case with CDO squared and uh, these all these types of securitizations, that was actually quite a fragile structure which cut, uh, collapsed in on itself. So you had a sort of market, taking markets to the extreme, you had a pro that problem, which was a very large technical problem which caused the crisis. But in parallel, and, you, and I saw this more in the UK um, when I was there because I dealt with some of the aftermath, is you had the undercutting of values um, of those market participants who abrogated, separated themselves from any sort of responsibility for the system, the financial system, or, or, or even their institution, the longevity of their institution. And that contributed to behaviors that uh, helped undercut things. So that's a classic, um, unfortunately, a classic example of what happens when we lose that balance between pure financial value and underlying values um, such as resilience, sustainability, solidarity that are necessary uh, to be twinned alongside with, uh, with dynamism that the market gives us. You're quoting from a, a sort of a checklist of values that you return to over and over uh, throughout the course of the book, uh, sort of seven core values that you think um, uh, need to be kept in mind for a healthy economy and a healthy society. Um, solidarity, fairness, responsibility, resilience, sustainability, dynamism, and humility. Um, those, and you save humility for last. Yeah. <laughs> There's a bit of suspense about that last one. Um, uh, um, essentially, a lot of those considerations went wheeling out the window during the, the during the, 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 the run up to the banking crisis. There, there was, there was heated, I've, I've read another book recently by um, this guy, Nicholas LeMann, called uh, Transaction Man where he says there was, there was heated debate within the Clinton administration, within the Bush administration that followed, over whether these markets in new financial products should be regulated at all. Uh, that it, just the more you sort of let them alone, that, that they would provide rapidly ballooning value. And that's what they did until the moment that the House of Cards collapsed. Yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly right. And to some extent, and, you know, it's... Um, it's, it's a bit unfair to, to put it all, it's certainly unfair to put it all on his shoulders, but there is a very telling testimony from Alan Greenspan, which is quoted in the book, uh, where he, um, I think, represents some of the th thinking that underlay those decisions, that, that sort of stepping back from the market, let the market take its course. Um, and part of what the thinking was, was that the individuals in these institutions themselves, <clears throat> pardon me, Paul, the institutions or the individuals would think ahead, would think about the importance of the institution, what could happen to their institution um, and, and take a degree of responsibility for the system, act as custodians. Well, no, they wouldn't. If it's purely, if it's purely sense of self as opposed to sense of solidarity for the system or having that broader horizon. Um, and we see that, you know, it's a story that happens over and over through finance. I mean, one of the things I talk about in the book is uh, with, in, with respect to the run up to the crisis is the three lies of finance that you see over and over again in crises. Um, this time it's different. You know, you have some good event or good development that happens and people extrapolate it to the, to the sky um, that the market's always right. You can't question the market price. There's, uh, there's a fundamental rationality there. And, and thirdly, the markets are moral. Um, and that morality is partly, it's predicated on those moral sentiments of Smith. <clears throat> the fact that, um, that, that people have a sense of that broader responsibility. And if, it's grad if that sense of responsibility is gradually squeezed out because other values are downplayed, it's the market sowing the seeds of its uh, its own demise. Um, and look, there there are ways, 
what's what's shown in the um, or what I try to show in the book in terms of crisis and then response is well, to what extent does the response to the crisis reinforce some of those values? And so one of the things I'll give you one example with respect to the financial crisis, which is um, they shifted in the UK, particularly while I was there, um, the way compensation for people in the financial sector work. And the more senior people, um, basically the vast majority of their compensation is held back for five to seven and potentially 10 years, at which point it can be clawed back from the individual if subsequently you find out, certainly if they've done anything wrong, but even if they've taken excessive risks at the time that uh, justified those uh, uh, that compensation being uh, being awarded, so you know their salary gets pulled back ultimately, that changes the horizon of the individual. Another thing we did was we put in place something called the senior managers regime to basically end the you know this this era of irresponsibility where senior managers could defend themselves by saying, well, I didn't know that somebody over there was doing this thing. It's certainly possible they didn't know, but had they trained the individual? Did they have compliance systems in place? Did they have a culture that looked askance or, 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 or um, uh, was against these type, of, uh, these type of activities which we saw in markets? Um, if they did, then okay, they have performed their function. But if they didn't, and in most cases in the run-up to the crisis, they didn't, then they too should bear responsibility because in the end, they are custodian custodians of their institutions. Do you think the, rev the, the, the reforms that have been brought in within the banking system itself uh, w by national governments and internationally are sufficient to ensure that, that what happened in 2007, 2008 can't happen again? Mm, I, think the, I think they have lessened, they've greatly increased the resilience of the system um, and, and uh, increase the res uh, degree of responsibility of, the, of those who are running institutions within the system. And that's part of the reason why the financial system uh, really did perform well in the COVID shock. I mean, it, it, it took a huge shock and, and, and um, was part of the solution, part of the solution, not the solution. Um, so in that regard, we've made a lot of progress. Um, we only really will be seen to fully have made progress, particularly around fairness, one of the values, um, uh, if and when a large financial institution fails and the cost is not borne by the taxpayer, by the citizens, but by those who ran the institutions and the shareholders. And, uh, and so the, 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 once we have clearly d uh, dealt with financial institutions being too big to fail, um, and they're and they're like any other uh, player in the uh, in the in the market economy. All of that said, um, I, I think there's a limit to which financial regulation rules um, can um, uh, they can certainly improve uh, these situations. But in the end, um, you know, you can't legislate virtue. You can't um, you know um, uh, by fiat have integrity, um, and it's it's part of a broader. Uh, societal uh, approach and a, and a set of attitudes that are necessary for to have have that true resilience in the system. Okay. Um, another crisis that you discuss, uh, unsurprisingly, is Brexit. Um, before we get into the meat of that, I, I, I do have some sort of culture shock questions to ask. Um, going from running the Central Bank of Canada to running the Central Bank of, of, of England um, was unprecedented. Um, and there was debate. I think most of it good natured about whether you could bring in a, a, a player from outside the league uh, um, uh, to, to, to lead your batting lineup or whatever the metaphor might be. Um, how, how weird was it in the doing uh, and, or, or how automatic was it? No, it's, um, it was certainly extraordinary circumstance. Um, it was only possible and it was helped by the fact that it was an extraordinary circumstance. I mean, the, to be candid, the, the system had failed in the UK. Um, all the major, virtually all the major financial institutions, banking institutions, had had to be rescued. Uh, there was tremendous public anger, uh, justifiably so, uh, about that. There'd been a huge economic shock, the, the biggest economic shock really within the G7 from the financial crisis. Um, and they had totally changed the system. So they had taken the Bank of England, which looked very much like an older version of the Bank of Canada and that its principal responsibility was monetary policy, so controlling inflation, and had only a sort of advisory or 
interested party uh, role for financial stability, the health of the financial system. Um, that's what it was before the crisis. In a mistaken belief that if you had price stability, you were more likely to have financial stability. Well, obviously that didn't work. Um, and so they tripled the powers um, of, of the Bank of England, gave them uh, oversight of the banks and the insurance companies, oversight for the system as a whole, very important point. So not just the individual pieces, but the system as a whole, uh, which is a tremendous weight of responsibility. Um, and um, it was a natural time to, to bring somebody in from the outside. Um, and it just turned out that, um, you know, total accident of history that I was that, uh, that somebody. So that helped. But um, to your question, yeah, it was exceptionally, you know, it was exception, exceptional circumstances. And my main value in that role was as an outsider, having a different perspective, being able to help make some changes, try to make the system work, um, and, um, and then hand it back. I mean, that was sort of the objective was to, was to you know, start this new Bank of England running with its new powers with, and some reforms, get the economy going and finish off these financial reforms and then, and then hand it back. Now, as it turned out, um, there was a couple extra years tacked onto the, uh, uh, onto the role because of, uh, because of Brexit. Um, you came under uh, the kind of withering scrutiny that only my colleagues in, in London can hand out uh, every time you made a public statement about Brexit, you were pasted by the tabloids and by some of the broadsheets um, uh, for just about everything you said. Um, basically, along because a, a lot of those um, uh, a lot of those papers are pro Brexit, and you were trying to lay out uh, an understanding of the difficulties that would essentially be inevitable as Britain went through that process. Uh, was that just flack? Was that just static? Or, or, or was that a real hindrance on your ability to get the job done? Uh, it wasn't a hindrance uh, on my ability to get the job done. Um, it was, um, but it certainly was intense, uh, without question. Um, I think, you know, one thing to recognize that uh, anybody who said anything about Brexit got that level of scrutiny and uh, uh, and depending on the perspective of the scrutineer, if you will, um, uh, was lambasted if uh, if there was any perceived difference. Um, I think the second thing, though, is you know, or, or the fundamental point really is so. And, and maybe to pull back to values here, one of our responsibilities at the Bank of England uh, was to make sure the system was resilient, that it could withstand shocks. So our job with respect to Brexit was to make sure that the financial system was ready for the worst form of Brexit, uh, that <clears throat> the worst form of Brexit that could happen, um, and that um, and that we took necessary steps in order to do that. Now it turned out that uh, in the run up to the referendum, we pre-positioned with the financial sector enough collateral so that we could lend them three hundred billion pounds instantaneously the morning of uh, after the vote. If if the, and that was a vote that going into that vote, even at 10 o'clock at night, um, the market was betting over 85% probability that it would go for remain. So nobody, very few people were well positioned with the exception actually of the Bank of England. So, um, and, and that's, that's part of, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a smaller, it's an important illustration of this point is you need some elements of the system, individuals who are thinking about you know, resilience is about being ready for what could go wrong um, and taking the necessary steps in order to uh, help mitigate that. Um, and uh, in that case, we had taken the steps. And the consequence of that was even if institutions were caught the wrong way, they could skate through it. And uh, the UK was in a better position to negotiate the treaty and, and, and move on. Um, and. Uh, so, you know, in the end, that was the, uh, that, that was a core lesson I take from it. In the end, our job was to make sure the system was ready, not to pick a side or, 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 or play to a, a certain, uh, uh, a certain, um, or, or uh, not to try to be apolitical by doing nothing to prepare. 
Because that, you know, that's an option and say, well, look, I made political, I didn't do anything and it's just an act of God. Well, no, it's not an act of God. I'm, it was a possibility and we were supposed to prepare for the possibility we did. Last point, in a democracy though, if you put 300 billion pounds on the line, you gotta be accountable for it and you have to justify why you've done it um, and you have to be transparent about it. And, and, and that's in the end what we did. And you appeared, I mean, uh, um... I followed your trajectory over there with one eye because there was there was stuff going on over here too. But you appeared a couple of times before parliamentary committees and uh, and spent you know substantial amounts of time. It seems to be hours explaining the permutations and the uh, the potential impact on trade at the border and at the channel and uh, um, uh, really walking the walk of of, of transparency with uh, with the electorate. Yeah, and you know their system is um, it's very robust, it's very detailed, very quickly. As if if you manage to catch any of those hearings, you realize that they they quickly go on to an issue, and it's what what I found interesting comparing the two experiences, testifying in Canada, testifying uh, there, is that once the if the committee al- alighted on a important issue the chair would sense it and the time would expand to deal with the issue. It wouldn't be, Oh, your three minutes is up. Now we got to move on, et cetera. You know, th- this was, uh, and so it was, um, it's very effective, uh, in terms of public accountability. Um, and, uh, and it meant that you prepared even more for those. Um, and you also prepared, see, this is, I mean, the good thing about that sort of effective, it's not a feedback mechanism, it's an accountability mechanism, is you think in those terms every day. Not in a sort of, oh, I should do this, so I have a memo that covers this, but what in the end is my responsibility? How is this rooted? One one, one other point I'll make, which is a lot of the discussions are rooted in what's your mandate, they call it a remit, but what's your remit? What are you supposed to be doing? And how does this connect to that remit? And could you have done something else that would have been more effective um, uh, than, than what you chose to do. And by the way, who in your organization disagreed with you when you decided to do this? Um, um, let's jump for a lot of those conversations were about what might happen if in the event of Brexit. Um, this is the great circumstance where we live in that afterworld now. And a lot of the advocates of Brexit said, what we now see plainly is that the fear stories were oversold. There are not lineups of, of trucks at the border, kilometers long, uh, the, 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 the economy hasn't collapsed. Uh, what, would you, what would you say about this uh, real world compared to the um, uh, speculation that preceded it? Well, I think uh, there's a couple of things. First, uh, I, I think any economic performance since this time last year is, you know, overshadowed by uh, the short-term dynamics of COVID, obviously, you know, the lockdowns and shutdowns. Uh, The, um, you know, we had a situation in the UK where uh, investment consistently underperformed from the moment of the referendum, from the moment of the calling of the referendum uh, right up to the present day. Uh, Weakest investment performance, in post-war history in the UK, at a time when, again, prior to the health uh, crisis, uh, you know, the world economy was growing, financial conditions were uh, very strong, uh, bank or uh, balance sheets of uh, British firms were in good shape. All the reasons to invest were there, except for one issue, which was around the uncertainty. Um, second thing that has happened: uh, one of the reasons why the trucks aren't lined up is the trucks aren't moving. Um, you know, you had the figures out um, just. Uh, when this comes out, it would be a few weeks ago, where you know, sixty um, percent plus uh, reduction in export traffic. Uh, you know, that's a that's a fairly large shock. That's a short term shock, but it's a fairly large shock. Um, and the consequence of you know, it's a product not of tariffs because the deal is tariff free, but it's a product of exactly the types of issues that were being drawn out in those parliamentary hearings in which we noted, which is. Um, non-tariff barriers, rules of origin, paperwork, these friction costs you get um, when you don't have an internal market, some of which we get in Canada, actually, because we don't have a full uh, internal market, as I know you've talked about in the past. Um, So um, 
But our expectation, what the, our issue at the Bank of England at the time or, was to make sure the financial sector was ready for Brexit. And we were in a position to get through the actual referendum, but we were within a year in a position where in our judgment, we could get through an extreme negative Brexit, no deal Brexit, borders closed, et cetera, the financial system could. Uh, and we were very clear about that. Um, and that, A, was our job, but B, that helped the government's um, negotiating position because the, the concern, in one of the concerns with a hard Brexit would have been that the financial sector would have amplified it, uh, amplified a negative economic shock. Um, as it turns out, and this is kind of a lesson uh, in terms of, again, resilience of a system, and it's a, you know, it's a great line of uh, Eisenhower's, uh, which is that plans, um, plans are useless, but planning is essential. Um, and you know, we prepared, we prepared, we prepared the Bank of England, I mean, for a hard Brexit, so-called hard Brexit, no deal Brexit. We happened to get COVID, but that meant the system was really, but, but the system was really, you know, strong. And so it sailed through COVID. Um, and, uh, and that's, you know, you, you, and that kind of goes to this, um, maybe the, I, I don't want to say the, uh, uh, the orphan value, but the, the, the value that, um, uh, comes at the end, as you say, which is around humility. So, you, you know, you can't predict the future, but you can prepare for versions of the future. And that often will, will, will put you in better stead when, uh, some, when the unexpected happens. Sure. This takes us to the, the, um, uh, much of the last chunk of the book, which is COVID and what to do after COVID. Um, uh, and, and a lot of that is bound up in the chapter of, uh, you know, how Canada can uh, help build the future. Um, it strikes me that a lot of the stuff in that Canada chapter must mirror conversations that you are reputed to have had with Prime Minister Trudeau last summer. Um, uh, and, and, and which members of his entourage were, were, were very eager to recount to us the fact that you had been on the phone with the guy. What was that about? Um, well, I mean, I, in a, by dint of having, you know, the various roles I had, um, and to some extent uh, by the unusual situ I mean, yeah, unprecedented situation, every country uh, has found itself in uh, with COVID. Um, you know, I am asked for advice and perspective by uh, a number of governments, um, including uh, from time to time uh, Canada's. Um, and obviously, I provide that uh, advice um, uh, as you'd expect, but there's nothing more structured than that. Um, and, um, and, and uh, you know, if, if the Prime Minister or any of the ministers here or, uh, uh, you know, contact me and want to know, then um, or my perspective on something, obviously, I, I provide it. Were you being solicited or were you testing the waters for an, an eventual uh, political career? Look, I, I have, there's lots of ways to serve, Paul. Um, and one of the ways to serve is to, uh, in fact, uh, the, the way I've been looking to serve over the course of, since I left the Bank of England has been twofold. One has been uh, to do the work with the UN in preparation for COP26, which is basically, um, and it goes to part of what's in the book, which is to get the private financial sector in a position uh, so that it's addressing climate change, so that climate change is part of every financial decision. And there's a series of things in there detailed in the book of, of what needs to be done, and we're making lots of progress on that. Uh, and the second uh, way to serve, um, at least you know, over the course of the last year, has been actually to write the book. I mean, uh, others will judge whether it's a, a service or a disservice um, to uh, impart all my thoughts on these various things. But really, you know, this effort to try to draw the lessons from these various crises. What are some of the common drivers and what can we do about it? Not just, you know, a very detailed diagnostic. Um, and, um, and uh, I guess, I guess the third is, uh, yeah, is to, is, is to provide advice uh, when asked. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's a fairly full plate of service uh, at okay. the moment. Um, all of my colleagues in the gallery are just going to laugh and point at me if I don't ask. So I might as well ask. Do you anticipate running for public office at some point? Uh, as I say, there's lots of ways to serve, I, but uh, I don't have any current plans. Okay. Um, 
Now let's get to what you actually say in that chapter. Um, uh, basically, it's about managing the transition from uh, the, 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 the massive spending that is needed to hold the economy in place yeah. to something not only more sustainable uh, afterwards, but um, to borrow a phrase, to build back better. Um, that's actually a phrase you don't use, if I'm not mistaken, in the book. Neither do you use the term Great Reset, which is which is yeah, which uh, was popular in some circles until it became unpopular in others. Yeah. Um, sorry, do you want me to yeah comment on the sort of general tra trajectory? I think yeah, yeah. So let's I mean let's start with um, fiscal the absolute you know necessary measures uh, to support individuals to support businesses try to bridge from uh, the economy we had you know when this started this time a year ago. Uh, to as we uh, exit COVID, um, we've had this uh, you know exogenous shock, this external shock, and and can we bridge individuals and bridge businesses so as many of those businesses and as many of those jobs are preserved uh, uh, over this period? Um, that that is temporary spending, obviously, and um, in that temporary spending, when the economy restarts, I mean it is spending that is a replacement for actual economic activity. So. Almost by definition, once the economy restarts, that spending goes away or should go away. You don't need to transfer to an individual who's um, uh, who's effectively furloughed if they're back at work. You don't need to support the working capital of a business if it's got working capital, et cetera. So that uh, gets tapered away. Um, now, but unfortunately, there will be jobs lost and there will be businesses that are shuttered. Um, and um, after the initial bounce that we will get, from a reopening, uh, the question is whether, uh, what what direction does the economy and how much momentum does the economy have? Uh, and I think the challenge for this government, the challenge for any government, is to move from spending, I mean, you really have three types of spending these days now. You have spending for COVID, this emergency spending. You have what's called current spending. So think, uh, you know, department, regular departmental spending, a, a, a tax credit, Canada child benefit would be, you know, another example. And the third is spending for capital, spending which either builds capital or incentivizes others to invest and build capital. And that capital, physical capital, technological capital, I mean, you write a lot about this on the infrastructure side, uh, natural capital, human capital, human capital, very importantly. Um, and, you know, the, the, the need is to transition from the first to the third as much as possible. And even within that transition to recognize um, that there are limits to spending, um, there are always limits to spending, um, and even in an environment where interest rates are low, uh, and it appears that are, there aren't limits, um, that there is a discipline, there needs to be a discipline to spending. Um, just some, because something's possible, doesn't mean it's optimal. Just because you can borrow and spend doesn't mean that's necessarily what you should do. The question is, what are you getting for that spending? And how do you balance spending or support with the re regulatory environment um, and ensuring that the private sector is, is properly playing those, uh, its role uh, to achieve what uh, ultimately what society wants? And so again, to and I'll, I'll finish with this just to pull it back to what I'm trying to argue in the book, is there's certain circumstances, and climate is a very obvious one, where we are starting to see this dynamic happen, where the, the clearer it is what society wants, what society values, which is environmental sustainability, getting to net zero, the more the market will orient itself to deliver that, and the more it will create financial value, and you, you get an alignment of those incentives. But if you're in a situation where you're trying to play off or balance in classic economic terms, environment versus the economy, uh, then you'll end up uh, in, a, in, a, in a worse situation for both. Um, and we see that both with COVID, value in health above all, uh, and we see it with climate. Um, and so with the, with the reorientation of spending that is, is, is gonna come and the, and the fiscal stance of the government, uh, having in mind what are those objectives, how do we set the economy in that direction, and in a way that the private sector is going to play a leading role in, in, in delivering those objectives as much as possible. So in that, there's two things that I think might represent real difficulty or at least real challenges for Canadian governments. The first thing is you repeatedly enjoin uh, Canadian governments to 
uh, not be seduced by low interest rates, not to say, well, uh, it's easier to spend money than it ever has been, unleash the hounds. Um, do you think that um, sufficient fiscal anchors have been put in place so far? Uh, I, I think there's a there's a need and there's a recognized need for um, fiscal anchors to be um, to be put in place. Uh, I think those fiscal anchors uh, reflect when you put in place a fiscal anchor, you 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 reflect your starting uh, position, um, which is you know we are starting from uh, a, 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 an extraordinary in an extraordinary crisis um, with large deficits, um, and where you can foresee a natural um, dropping of the baton, if you will. Um, uh, and that's what we want to avoid, which is that we have, we will have an initial quite strong growth spurt when the economy reopens. Uh, once the health price under that people have saved, um, there's pent up demand, uh, balance sheets are okay in many sectors. So there will be this pickup. The U.S. will come out uh, strongly in all likelihood. But the question is what that rolls into after those initial uh, several, you know, few quarters. Um, and so we do have to be mindful uh, of that and provide support, but support that is sustainable. And I think this is a key point, which is, you know, ultimately we can talk about fiscal st sustainability and, you know, our view will lose any viewers that are left um, uh, at, at this point. Um, we talk about environmental sustainability as well. The sustainability is about people's livelihoods, right? It's whether they have sustainable jobs, uh, and sustainable prospects. So you have to have that anchor in terms of managing uh, managing policy. And you also have to have, and I, I, you know, I'll, I expect governments in Canada to do, federal and provincial, um, again, discipline around, is this program going to be effective? Is this spending going to be effective? Not just, can I do it? Um, and, um, and, that, and that competence, if you will, around spending will be, uh, will be important. For the economy, but also for you know Canadians' confidence and trust in the, in their governments. You even envisaged a new role for the parliamentary budget officer to essentially certify the probable return on investment of any new capital expenditure. To say this uh, program of roads and bridges and ports is going to be better for the economy than the immediate cost over the long run. Uh, that would be a new thing for the parliamentary budget officer to do. Yeah, it would be a new thing, and it would require additional resources to make those judgments and uh but it's uh, it's a sensible check in terms of uh in terms of infrastructure investments uh it's also though uh, one of the other points i make uh which is when we think about our national balance sheet uh in the country there is the physical capital and that, that's quite a broad sense in terms of uh, infrastructure investment um and whether there's a return on the new uh investment there. Um, there's human capital, um, all our skills and expertise, and you know, maybe I don't know if we have time to talk about it, but this is a pretty crucial point in and around the other changes that are happening in the economy and what that means really for reworking how we think about skills, including how we even think about our lifetime education and, and having you know, a fourth layer of education that's integrated with the, um, uh, with the welfare system. Um, um, and the third type of capital, of course, is natural capital and actually properly accounting for natural capital in the country and, and whether or not we're adding or subtracting uh, from our natural capital. Um, and, you know, that that last point, the looking at those balance sheets uh, isn't going to happen over, overnight. And I would concentrate first on the return on the on, on the physical capital, what you raised in terms of uh, and, and using again, as not a fiscal anchor, but as a form of um, guardrail or input or scrutiny uh, from, from an enhanced PBO, a parliamentary budget office, uh, to do that uh, would, be, uh, would be valuable in my view. Okay. The last uh, problem, and it's not a small one, is that um, to the extent that the uh, investment for the future is green investment, it's increasingly hard for me to see where Alberta's oil sands fit into that picture at all? Yeah, well, it, first off, it's it's central. This is absolutely central. And, uh, uh, you know, our, our transition to net zero has to front and center have an energy policy that um, uh, reinforces our strengths um, across a wide range of energies um, that sees a transition 
um, in fossil fuels um, that uh, maximizes um, the value and the jobs uh, from them, reinvests the proceeds in the new jobs as much as possible. And when I say reinvest, I'm not saying it all goes to government and government reinvests, including the companies and that they have the incentives and the support uh, in order to do it. Um, that recognizes as well that in um, given the timeframes and given the scale of the uh, transition, um, that there likely does will need to be significant support in certain regions that are undergoing, and, and the West uh, specifically, that are undergoing these rapid transitions to help um, ensure that it is a quote just transition that is a transition that leads new jobs now if you look at if you look at the oil sands where um, there has been a lot of a there's you know the oil sands are um, you know uh, the product of uh, great technical innovation over the course of my lifetime um, and I've, it's been with, I mean I'm from there literally um, born just north of there and grew up just south of there um, so I've seen that technological innovation and what's there central to the next phase of that innovation has to be carbon capture uh, and storage. Um, and there we have the first phase of that. That, by the way, as you I think know, is a, is a technology that is relevant, not just for the oil sands, it's relevant for blue hydrogen, um, one of the key transition fuels, uh, and actually probably end state fuels. It's relevant for a series of industrial processes and others. You know, we will not get to net zero, uh, even on prospective technologies without effective carbon capture and storage and use. Um, and we also have to think, sorry, I'm to bounce around a bit, but going back to the oil sands, is where its role is nationally, where its exports markets are, um, and how it can continue to make progress and has to continue to make progress, not just being in a low risk environment, so low political risk environment, all the advantages of Canada, um, but being low cost, and low carbon, and low carbon well the wheel, low carbon delivered as an energy source, um, but with a clear uh, expectation of the range of possible outcomes and, and, and timeframes over which it will provide energy, both in Canada uh, and abroad, and what we are investing in to replace it uh, over time, and 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 uh, and very importantly in the regions um, that uh, that will be most impacted. Um. A lot of folks in Alberta are, are going to say it's really easy for these two swells in Ottawa to talk about that. But in the in the short term, and the short term is is years, it's going to mean that um, uh, careers that have been built on the assumption that Alberta's job is to get oil sands, oil to market, are going to be disrupted or end. And the uh, economic cost uh, to a province that has been an economic leader um, is is going to be like a huge shock. Yeah, well, the, um, I think the key is to recognize that um, there is this transition that is going on in the world. Uh, we've got 130 countries and counting that are committed to net zero. Um, there are certain um, consequences that fall from that in terms of cumulative emissions that can happen between now and that point. In 2050, um, and the question is, which are going to be the what are going to be the sources of those emissions? What's the role for fossil fuels? What's the role for oil sands and Western Canadian gas in fossil fuels? How do we maximize that role and ensure that as much as possible uh, we're reinvesting in the industries and jobs of the future? Uh, I, I I think that the um, what's critical is. Is, is looking at that energy transition as a whole, looking at it over the course of the next few decades, and it's not gonna be longer than the next few decades, um, recognizing that um, uh, we have a role to play and we can uh, play an even bigger role if, if we see where we want to go, okay? Where we see where we want to go and now, this is where, and to bring it, if I can bring it back to an uh, earlier bit of our conversation, which is around, you can't plan everything. This is where humility comes in. You can't plan out exactly. I know exactly what the energy transition is going to look like. I know exactly what the end state fuels are going to be in 2050. I think we can predict sort of the broad elements of it, but within the portfolio of green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, 
um, the relative importance of carbon capture and storage versus direct air cap uh, carbon capture, uh, the role of um, uh, the role of fuel blends, the role of the the alternative uses of bitumen, um, which export markets on a well to wheel basis uh, within the United States and 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 in which markets within Canada can we continue to supply? All of those questions uh, are ones that we need to be addressing and thinking about them from a uh, from, uh, from, from a portfolio perspective, so there's a portfolio of, of technologies, and we need to we need to place big investments, principally in the private sector, but supported by public regulation and in some cases public investment, and a real dialogue in a series of areas in order in order to make sure that uh, we maximize the potential of um, not just of, of of the resources in the ground, but the human potential that's uh, associated with it. Um, and that can only happen, not with a you know simple slogans on, on um, on uh, on on the issues, but uh, through really a determined, and you know it's almost become I was gonna I was gonna say the the you know an energy policy. God forbid that we talk about you know an, an actual <laughs> energy policy. I know I grew up in Edmonton. I know the issues with uh, you know if you add one uh, one word in front of energy policy. But we do need a Canadian uh, energy policy um, that is is multi-decade, multi-stakeholder, multi multi um, faceted. Let me, if I can make one other point, Paul, which is um, you know one of the you know one of the great strengths of Canada, um, and it can be a frustration at times for those involved. But one of the great strengths of Canada is our ability ultimately to forge consensus if we're focused on a specific issue, and we need to be resolutely focused on this issue. And yes, there's a federal provincial element to this, as, as there is in virtually any issue in Canada, but there's an enormous private sector uh, element to it, um, of course. Um, other stakeholders, um, Indigenous Canadians, um, the financial sector as well, and we need to have a process and work towards, okay, what's going to be in that portfolio? Who's doing what? Where do we, where do we place our investments? And by the way, recognize even if we get it right, and we should get it right, but even if you get it right, you get quite large turnovers of jobs and opportunities in, in, in these situations when you have big technological change and, and shifts. And so how are we going to ensure uh, that the people in Alberta and in Saskatchewan and Newfoundland, other, you know, that, that, that they are transitioning into those uh, it, uh, as much as possible into the new jobs that are, that are created. Um, and that needs to be very deliberate. And it needs, you know, it, it needs to start now. Mark Carney, you've been very generous with your time and I appreciate it, but I think we'll let you go on to your, uh, your many other activities. Um, Mark Carney is former governor of the Bank of Canada, former governor of the Bank of England. His new book is called Values, uh, and it's uh, now available for sale. Um, I want to thank everyone at home uh, for watching, and I want to thank, as always, our sponsors of the Canadian Bankers Association for making these conversations possible. We'll see you again soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.